this is it's March 29th and I know I'm sorry it's March 30th 30th and um, this is Senate government operations and what we're doing today is just um, we had a bill s147 that talked about language access and we um, heard from Susanna Davis who um, talked to us about what her language access program is doing in the administration and with different departments and agencies. So we didn't, didn't pass the bill because it seemed that, thank you, because it seemed um, so unnecessary because of what she was doing. So what we did instead was um, say that we would, we would continue the conversation about around language access for legislative activities and how, what we need to do, what we need to, what we can do, what's feasible, how, how it works out. So we're going to just have that discussion today. It's just, um, we're going to hear from some of our legislative staff about what, what they've been doing because they've been working really hard on this issue and trying to, um, make it accessible um, to the deaf and hard of hearing community. And um, so we're just gonna have a discussion about what, what that means and how we go about it and um, what, what more we can do and maybe what we can do in the short run and what has to happen in the long term. So that's where we are. We're, this isn't, we don't have a bill, we're not doing, um, we're not responding to a bill. There's nothing to pass here. It's just a general discussion about where, where we might go. And if we come up with anything that we can all agree on, we can always um, suggest it to the Sergeant at Arms and to our staff and to our State House Advisory Committee. Yeah. So this is, this is the legislative branch. That's what we're talking about right now. So with that, I think that what we'll do is go first um, to Mike and um, Kevin and um, if Damien is with us um, and just have a, have you talk to us about what, what you, I know you've been working really hard on um, this project and just kind of where you are, what's going on what we should expect. Is it long-term, short-term? So this isn't, there's nothing about this that is, um, this is just informational. There's nothing about this that is calling you on the carpet or anybody else, or this is just informational for us. Um, and I wanted to say that because I understand there was a little bit of anxiety about what we were really up to here. And we try to be a very friendly committee and try not to put people on the um, spot. spot, that's the word. So here we are. So Kev, I don't know how you want to do this, with Kevin and Mike, if you want to um, uh, just start off with the two of you and however you want to do it. And, and they, Mike did arrange for us to have both a sign interpreter and the closed captioning for this session. So thank you very much. So would you like to talk to us a little bit about what you're doing and where you're going and what we can do to help or what we can, if it's just staying out of the way or whatever it is that we can do. Uh, so I certainly don't want to step on your toes, Mike. You are more than welcome to jump in first if you want to talk about uh, the experience from your side of things and I can fill in if you want or I can start and. You can jump back and forth, what works for you? Um, why don't I just talk, Kevin, and, and sure. if I get something that you want to elaborate on or correct, then maybe just interrupt. Sounds um, good. So Mike Front, Director of Legislative Operations, um, and we have so far worked with a company called Dan Crow to schedule ASL or American Sign Language um, interpreters by request. 
for committee hearings as well as the House floor. We also have enlisted a current state contract to provide captioning. It's through a state um, contract with T-Mobile, Kevin, I believe. And it's with the executive branch, so we're using it as a stop gap while we uh, work on a, a contract with a company in Vermont called White Coat Captioning. That would be more of a consistent um, service that we could use, again, on request. So these things cost money uh, each time we use them by the hour. They both require advanced scheduling, so up to 48 hours, at least 48 hours in advance. And once we've set up that scheduled service, we would really appreciate that time being um, kept because we have to pay for when we start the scheduling to when we end the scheduling. That's where we're at right now with it. I've worked with Laura Siegel and the folks at the Department of uh, Independent Living, Dale, um, on this. They've given great feedback and we've been able to improve the process and the experience each time we do it. Um, you know, I'll certainly jump right in there uh, for the record, Kevin Moore, Legislative IT. Um, so I, I think it's also important that we take a step back um, and, and look at the history of accessibility uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so obviously we're in a brave new world, courtesy of a pandemic, and we uh, leverage that time frame to uh, make our entire process much more transparent and accessible than what it used to be. Uh, I don't recall where we were uh, specifically prior to the pandemic as far as uh, requesting an ADA accommodation for uh, ASL or CART services or other uh, similar uh, accommodations uh, for language uh, translation. Uh, but I believe it was very rare uh, if ever used uh, within the, uh, the organization. And so we're kind of learning on the fly here. We're making sure that we understand what our obligations are under ADA law. We're taking that lead uh, from legislative council and the other attorneys throughout the building. Uh, we are moving as quickly as uh, the legislative process and our budget allows us to. Uh, to accommodate all of these needs um, and, and make sure that we're, we're meeting people where they are. Um, so as Mike uh, alluded to, we are in the process of uh, contracting with a third party professional uh, stenographers. Um, and I look forward to having that service available in the near future directly through us. Um, it is an expensive service, though it's something that we have to pay attention to uh, over time. Uh, the other piece is uh, American Sign Language. Uh, that's a service that we can obviously offer as we are right now uh, quite readily. Uh, and as far as uh, language accessibility, we don't have anything natively built into our website as for language accessibility, but almost every single modern web browser offers the ability to translate using artificial intelligence into a, a litany of languages. Um, so I, I mean, I haven't found a language not available yet. Now, I obviously don't personally speak those languages, so I can't personally speak to the quality of that, that translation. But if you use multiple uh, translation services, again, artificial intelligence, to kind of check each other, they seem to be pretty good. Um, but we could always improve. The one area of improvement that I think that we can uh, continue to move towards uh, when it comes to web accessibility and language uh, access is how we post documents. So anything that's native to the website built in line to the web page can be translated pretty readily, but a document in PDF form would have to either be extracted, uh, uh, downloaded and re-uploaded to a translation service, or you can copy that text using um, our, our PDFs as we post them because we use OCR, uh, which allows that text to be searchable and readable by screen readers. Um, then you take that and you upload it to another service and it would uh, translate that uh, using artificial intelligence as well. And that's a free service uh, through most browsers. Again, I don't speak the languages, so I can't can't speak to the quality of those translations, uh, but it certainly is uh, a step in the right direction compared to where we were uh, in the last handful of years. Hopefully that's helpful to the discussion. Thank 
Can you just give us a sense of, just take our committee, for example. We meet two and a half or three hours, four days a week. So that's I don't know how many, how many, four times three, about 12, 12 to 15 hours a week. Can you give us a, a ballpark figure of what it would take to financially to to do um, closed captioning and also ASL, and then um, I guess the translation um, web that's that's a free service. You just have to be on top of it and submit it. And... Um, sort of. Uh, so I, let, let's talk to the card and ASL first. That's something we can okay. we can really uh, talk about the uh, quoted rates, and these are the uh, bulk rates and uh, um, the, the cheaper rates, if you will. Um, for cart services is $140 an hour. Uh, and that's per meeting. And then you turn around and you look at ASL and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, that's somewhere between 80 and $120 an hour, depending on the service. Um, and there are minimums to be met. So in, in some cases, it would be a one hour minimum. Uh, and then depending on uh, the contract, there are potential for overages, usually by the quarter hour, uh, even if you only go over a minute or two. Uh, and so the cost can add up quickly if you look at the approximately 24 committee meetings that we have daily, not including joint committee meetings um, and, and uh, the one-offs that we have out there, say rules and uh, things of that nature or caucuses. So the cost can add up quite quickly if you look at the hourly content. Um, let me see if I can pull up quickly uh, so I can get a, a quick figure for you, pardon me. So, for example, uh, we have in the neighborhood of 10,000 hours of content on YouTube alone. So that is just the last two and a half sessions at this point. Uh, it's actually about two sessions if you uh, look at the timeline because we started streaming to YouTube in about mid-March of 2020. So we have two sessions, 10,000 hours, and you can use that figure to quickly understand how much it would cost the legislature uh, to uh, provide both CART and ASL services. As far as the language translation goes, if you're talking uh, website side, as far as content, access to content, uh, that is just based off of a free browser. You do have to have access to, to uh, technology. So uh, with our libraries and such opening back up, hopefully that helps uh, prevent that barrier to technology. And I'm not, personally certain on what the process would be if there is, even is one currently standing uh, for the legislative branch to provide a translated transcript, if any, uh, to a uh, requester. That's something I'd, I'd certainly have to defer on. And just to add to Kevin's earlier comment about the cost or the um, coordinating of the American Sign Language, um, for a meeting that is more than two hours or more than an hour, they will have to schedule two people like we have in this current meeting. So, cause they take turns. So that's twice the cost um, as we go meeting by meeting with your example, Senator White. And for example, today, if we thought we were starting at two and we actually started at three, um, yeah. yeah. The legislative schedule is um, very unpredictable. It is, and when you asked about what could you do to help this process or to help us, I think really deliberately scheduling these discussions or bills that would um, naturally have an accommodation with them for a time that's not after the floor, but more predictable and more controlled by you, I think would be a good use of that scheduling process. Even though it is fluid, you, you really can't control the floor like today. And so scheduling something like this for after the floor makes it difficult. Right. The problem, the problem is when you're, if you're thinking about um, scheduling and when people have an interest, we, we don't know what issues our bills people might have an interest in. Um, it isn't just a bill or a comment conversation about 
language access. I mean, that's clearly, <laughs> there's an interest there, but it may be uh, a bill about the judicial system or about uh, licensing of particular, it, it could be anything that- could be anything in all our committees. Anything in all our committees. So if we're talking I mean, about, just, yeah, that's- and Yeah, go ahead. So it, uh, for a hard of hearing, the the YouTube of our meetings is available 24 hours afterwards with a much better translation, right? So we have that at the moment. So that is the most affordable thing for people if they're not testifying. I mean, if they aren't actively participating right. the way today they are, but if they are not actively participating, the most uh, reasonable way is for people to watch the YouTube 24 hours later, right? Uh, so I, I won't speak to reasonable, it's certainly available. I'm sure there are many opinions on that, um, Senator Clarkson, uh, as far as uh, uh, whether it's uh, a good quality translation or not, or transcript or not, excuse me. Uh, it is certainly available approximately 24 to 72 hours after the uh, conclusion of a live stream. Uh, it is a, a YouTube-based service that uh, pro uh, provides closed captioning uh, with either timestamps available uh, or not if you want to uh, take that transcript. And a lot of folks make good use of it. It's not perfect, uh, but it is far better than the Zoom real-time live transcription service that we've used in the past um, or are currently potentially using in this case if, if folks are using it within the room as well. I don't have it on my screen, but I think I see it on the screen in the background here. And uh, so it's better. It's good. It's not perfect. Uh, it's right. not, it does not replace a, uh, uh, an actual person uh, creating that transcript. Uh, but it's a wonderful starting point. Uh, and it's something that we've used uh, successfully over the last couple of years to uh, allow for um, transcripts to be uh, produced a little more rapidly. So I see uh, Dr. Perone has a, a comment. Would you like to? Weigh in here. <clears throat> yeah. Judy, Thank you. Bear with us while the interpreter unmutes herself. Yes, I'd like to introduce myself. Thank you very much. I am a deaf individual myself and I use American Sign Language. And I just wanna make share a message with you when the legislative in Massachusetts had this discussion, it was very similar and the process was set up and then distributed. And the discussion of cost of interpreters and in CART for edgy, every le legislative session is not relevant necessarily. You know, when we're talking about the bills, the impact it has on deaf and hard of hearing individuals, automatically interpreters and CART services will be provided, but not everything will request um, American Sign Language interpreters and CART. But Unfortunately, the website and all of the information there is not accessible to an ASL user. So that system needs to be addressed. And second of all, when it comes to a public hearing where deaf or hard of hearing or deaf blind individuals, you know, would be attending. Yes, you have to have interpreters and CART providers readily available. It cannot wait. It needs to be taken care of immediately for testimony. So, um, no, that, oh, you know, sorry. that was just my experience in, in dealing with the state of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Go ahead, yes. So um, you said that it wasn't um, available to, um, ASL users, the the did or maybe I misunderstood you. I thought you said that it what the um, the translation services on the bottom weren't available to ASL users, or did I misunderstand?
Let me just read back for a second. Yeah, if you don't mind, could you clarify specifically what it is you're asking me about? Sure. I thought I heard you say that um, the, the translation services were not available to, uh, not translation, but the, the whatever you call that. Captioning. What? Captioning. Captioning was not available to ASL users, and I'm it's confused by that. Yeah, because we thought it was available for everybody. Okay, now I understand your question. Thank you for clarifying. So yes, we cannot assume that all deaf individuals are going to be also fluent in English, which would be the transcript. Um, you know, I definitely can. English is a second language of mine, but American Sign Language is my first language and it's more readily understood without having to interpret it into another language. So for example, there are gonna be individuals who you know, are not fluent in English and they would be forced to only be able to access the message through CAR. And with that said, then they would really not be able to understand, you know, the transcript from a CART provider in written English. American Sign Language is a first language that is distinctly different from English. And therefore, some users would absolutely need American Sign Language as an accommodation. You're going to meet individuals that are going to prefer one over the other because there is a wide variety of language among deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And I hope that clarified things for you. Oh, sure. And I think we certainly understand that that all people who use um, ASL are not English speakers. Um, that English isn't their second language. That, so that presents another problem. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Some deaf individuals like myself are definitely bilingual. Mm -hmm. But again, I still prefer to use, you know, my first language, which is American Sign Language. Because I can, I, I think and process in my own native language. Mm -hmm. So it's easier, more readily available if it's provided to me in my preferred language, which is American Sign Language. Mm -hmm. So I have one other question of other people do, I mean, we should weigh in here, but um, the other question I have is when you were talking about Massachusetts, one of the things that you said, I think I heard was that um, the cost is irrelevant. How is that possible? And I, I just, um, cost is a big issue for us because we we have very limited limited funds and the legislative branch does not have um, a lot of funds. So I just wondered what you meant by cost was irrelevant or it probably should be irrelevant, but it is but relevant. It is, Yes, exactly. The services are definitely going to cost. And there are plans to be able to make the costs more efficient. Like, for example, providing American Sign Language interpreters for every single legislative session would be, you know, definitely not the best approach. Providing interpreters and car providers that would have a legislative session, session that involved a deaf or hard of hearing bill or issue. But it would be very important to, you know, be able to communicate with, you know, the deaf community about when that's going to happen. So the deaf community would be aware and could make a request. But if there is no request, then there's no reason to have to pay for and provide that type of service unless someone is specifically interested in it. 
let's say, for example, there's a bill, something to do with the legislative, you know, rules or whatever, uh, deaf people may not want to, you know, request an interpreter for that. Okay, so you really are saying leave it. Oh. But again, when it comes to providing testimony at a hearing, you know, we're the first group, you know, that is where there's going to be, you know, a cost factor in those testimonies that those hearings can take two, three hours. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, uh, a couple, few years ago, maybe four years ago now, in this committee, we worked on um, the establishing the Deaf Hard Hearing Council or expanding it and getting it reactivated. And um, we had an interpreter with us all of, all of those times whenever we dealt with that issue. Exactly, yes. Okay. Mike, you had your hands up. Oh, sorry. Mike, did you have your hand up? Sure, um, just to dovetail on Dr. Perone's point. That's why my relationship with Laura Siegel and Dale and the council you referenced is so important because we had a bill, there's a bill in the Senate now in Senate Health and Welfare, H266, regarding um, hearing aids. Yes. And companies. And so because we know that, Laura and I are able to work together to track it on the agenda planning process. I'm able to work with the committee assistant in that committee to understand when it's going to be taken up and then schedule those services and then communicate to him or the chair, please make sure that as you revolve your agenda, this one stays put as much as possible. And that coordination, that collaboration about bills specific to this community is really how we can make the process most accessible to them. And that's a reminder for this committee that it should always be on a Tuesday because that's the only day when we, know. When, we know, when we don't have floor session in the afternoon. Yeah. So it's well, just, sometimes on Friday, we know we have a late day. I, but you have to schedule like 48 hours in advance. We don't know what the schedule will be 48 hours in advance. Um, because the agenda is passed yet, the calendar isn't printed yet. So really, Tuesday. I see uh, Kevin has his hand up. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, I just want to dovetail off what Mike was saying. I, I think we're moving in exactly the direction that Dr. Perone was speaking about uh, in making these services available by request, but also with my coordinating uh, with the deaf and hard of hearing community, as he uh, just mentioned. Uh, so one of the things we're hoping to have up and available in some fashion um, by uh, early next week would be a request form process uh, on the legislative website. Um, it's gonna start um, as bridging the gap, if you will, because we currently don't have it available on our website. We're gonna create an interim process. We're gonna quickly refine that to make it very accessible in uh, no less than three locations uh, on the website, all very copious uh, or uh, very um, conspicuous, easy to get to. Uh, and uh, we will make sure that we continue to leverage that process for all ADA accommodations uh, and translation uh, processes uh, that, that we uh, continue to learn about as we work through this process. Great, great. Um, any other questions right now around the ASL? Yeah, Anthony. I, I don't want to in any way undermine the organizations and the people that are already doing this work, but I have to wonder whether it would make any sense for the legislature to have a signer on staff be available all the time, you know, somebody who's a salaried person who spends their time in the state house and is paid a salary as opposed to an hourly rate. May I just tag on to that idea? Sure. Uh, Anthony, I think that we should use track the amount we actually use in the next year or two. I think one of the key things would be is going to be to track the requests and track how, mu how much it's actually used. And I think if it if it's uh, requested over you know over a certain amount, I think that's absolutely 
a great idea. I think that may be a little premature right now. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think you'd have to figure it out. Think ahead. You also would have to have two people because um, right, one gets tired. Well, yeah, it's it's very tiring to be a translator. So you have to or an interpreter, not a translator, an interpreter. Um, so. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, like in my ideal world, at some point, party of one here, you are asking people in a lot of different languages to keep track of how we communicate here, how we communicate in government. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually the state should have a staff of people who speak commonly requested languages or sign commonly requested languages. Um, to help with not just retroactive requests or in the moment requests, but proactively make videos about how to respond in an emergency situation. So, you know, something that is important for people to understand about a particular program. I mean, eventually, I think our website should be full of videos where people are signing and people are also speaking languages that might not even have a written component that are very popularly spoken in the state. Right, and I I agree with that. I don't think there probably are emergencies that the legislative branch no. addresses. We're just talking today about the legislative branch. <laughs> right. No, we'll I just think it's before. better if we borrow oh, a state from, person. You know, if yeah, yeah. we're going to get scale if we have one person, or obviously two people yeah. in the state, and say, oh, can they help right now? You know, but I think there's right. enough work in all three branches of government to keep people busy with ongoing things, yeah. not necessarily on demand interpretation. Is is that, um, can I, Susanna, right now, just put you on the spot and ask <coughs> if that's something that you have been thinking about in your language access program? Yes. Um, good afternoon, Susanna Davis, racial equity. Oh, this isn't a hearing. Uh, well, racial equity director for the state, anyway. Um, yes, this is something that we are thinking about for the language access plan. It is for legislation, for the purposes of the legislative branch, um, what you're really looking for when you think about language access is being able to have um, oral interpretation during testifying in committees, uh, oral interpretation for being able to answer constituent questions or other inquiries that come directly to the legislature, uh, oral interpretation for people who want to have meetings with legislators, and then you want to think about written translations for website materials, um, and that's going to include things like the meeting agendas, information about bills, instructions on how to engage in this process, which is all stuff we've been talking about. And then you want to make sure that you're thinking about signage for wayfinding when people come to the building. So when you're thinking about which staff, whether to employ staff, and how many and who they should be and where they should sit, um, you want to think about that having a single point of contact is going to be really helpful. I think to Senator Rom Hinsdale's point, should it be someone who's employed directly and exclusively by the legislature, or should it be somebody who has a focus that extends across multiple branches? We'll probably get um, we'll probably get more ability to be nimble and flexible if we have somebody who interacts with all three branches. However, you'd have to work out the details um, about that that level of scope and make sure that they are supported, right? One person, it would be a large workload for the one person. You wanna make sure that they also are doing things like coordinating the hiring or contracting of services um, to the extent that Mike and Kevin may wanna offer some of that. Um, coordinating with Sergeant Arms for visitors. And that's gonna um, also connect with some of the ADA work that we need to make sure that we're doing in terms of physical accessibility to the building. Um, so, Yes, these are all things that we are thinking about for a unified statewide language access plan. But, you know, I think that if we're talking about employing people on staff, it's good to have a person. It's better to have two. But, I mean, if we have two separate hearings of three hours each, that really means four people, right? And that's just for ASL. We're not even talking about other spoken languages. So um, I think that we really have to understand, and then, and again, that's just one branch of government. That's not even judiciary, which may be holding hearings that day, as is their nature, or anyone in the executive. Um, so a staff, we would really need a small militia 
of people equipped to do this in, in a number of different languages. Thanks. That's, um, I mean, I'm thinking about uh, how we, uh, how we translate, not, not, not how we interpret, um, but how we translate the documents and the things that we do. And surely we should have some ability to, to at least translate, um, have some translation on the of how to how to access how to use the the system i mean how what what the process is right. so people can understand and then have a, a translation of the summaries of the acts once they're done some translating the the of the uh the bill itself is pretty meaningless because most people can't understand i mean it, it's so legalese that but the summaries that are done are really good and so, yeah, ideally our webpage would say like have an accessibility button you could click on and then it would take you to a page that shows you who the ADA and designee is for the legislature, how you access interpretation, um, like how you make requests, any other pertinent information that that's what colleges are doing now, you know, like I think other institutions have have gone ahead of us in terms of a landing page where you know that if information should exist, it would be there. And if it's not there, it probably doesn't exist, but people shouldn't have to go fish around to figure it out. Yeah, that was um, Kevin, Mike, did you hear? And I see Damien is with us now also. I did, there he is. Um, is that something that at some point could be possible to have that on the website so that there is just yeah, so uh, um, we're certainly moving in that direction. That's what oh. we're trying to uh, establish as we speak. Uh, we're building that page out as we speak. As we're focused primarily on the operational concerns right now, making uh -huh. sure we provide those services to the folks that are requesting them in real time as we speak, uh, and building that page in the background with the access to these resources. Uh, I believe uh, Mike and Damien have some uh, specific information about what that ADA uh, designee might look like, uh, but we're certainly coordinating on an operational level to make sure that uh, we can provide the services uh, in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So we'll ask Mike and Damien if they have, and we know that you've been working really hard on this and taking this very seriously. So we're, we're pleased that this is something that is in the front of your minds, along with all the other things you have to do. So, um, Mike or Damien, do you want to weigh in on what Kevin just said? Go ahead, Damien. <laughs> um, so what I can speak to is, you know, we're, we're aware of the requirement that we have a designee and Mike and the Sergeant at Arms office have been coordinating about how requests for an accommodation are handled with requests related to committee services going through Mike. Uh, and then requests related to physical access to the building going through the sergeant at arms. Um, this is, it's definitely a work in progress at this point, but I, I know Mike and Kevin have been doing a huge amount of the actual heavy lifting um, on this uh, behind the scenes, just in terms of getting things stood up, signing contracts, getting bids on services from outside providers, et cetera. Um, so, but from the ADA perspective, the, the key is that we're able to provide that access and having that point person who can not only handle the request, but also can uh, receive a complaint if we don't provide the access and can help evaluate um, the re request for accommodation and, and direct them to the right place in terms of making sure that whoever needs to be talked to, uh, to coordinate access uh, is talked to um, so that we can, can take those steps quickly. Um, that's definitely something I think Mike and Kevin have been working uh, very hard on to, to implement at this point. Thanks, Mike. And um, thank you, Damien, and thank you to Kevin. I also want to really thank Laura Siegel and the folks at TAIL. They've been a real 
important resource in my learning about this uh, as we've moved forward. So um, we're hopeful to get there. Thank you, Laura. And um, we try to improve each time we offer the experience. Great. Great. Any, well, I'm, I'm real happy that you've been working on this. And, Do you mind um, if I say something Laura's asking? Oh, please. Yes, please. Sorry, Laura. Hi, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Laura, Laura Siegel, and I'm a director here at the Deaf and Heart for Deaf and Hard of Hearing and Blind Services I'm here at Dale. And I just wanted to add uh, to Dr. Perone's comment. Dr. John Perone, his comment that he had earlier about ASL and captioning. I just wanted you to keep in the back of your mind that um, not everybody who uses sign language can rely on the captioning. So. Um, for example, the AV system, the audio visual system is another option um, for hard of hearing people. And there are other assisted technologies that can help depending on needs. So there are a lot of options that are out there. And I just wanted to um, let you know that they're there and not to only consider just um, sign language interpreting services and captioning. And the other thing that I wanted uh, for you to consider um, having to do with document translation. Uh, I, I do have a colleague who's the director of deaf, uh, of blind and visual impairment. Um, and they work underneath Dale and they have, um, they might be able to um, give you more um, insight to how to ex how to provide accessibility for low vision or or people with limited sight. Good. Thank you. And I, I see both Mike or Kevin and Damien have their hands up. But I'm going to say that um, if you're working closely with Laura, then <laughs> doing the thing that you should be doing and the right thing. So um, I saw Kevin's hand go up and then I saw Damien. So Kevin. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I, it, Laura's uh, uh, comments uh, triggered a, another thought that I think I failed to mention, and it's about hard of hearing services, so assisted listening. And that's another uh, area that we have expanded on over the last couple of years. We currently have a couple of mobile carts that provide assisted listening services that uh, was currently or used today, actually, in house government operations in room 11, uh, where we're able to tap into the audiovisual system to be able to provide that hearing assistance to those uh, that require it uh, in a handful of different ways. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to discuss that if you want, as far as how many different ways we can provide it, but uh, uh, hearing assistance is available within the, the uh, General Assembly uh, by request. Oh, great, great. Damien, do you? Yeah, I just, um, to build off what Laura said is, uh, one thing that's worth remembering is that the accommodation uh, goes to the individual with the disability. And so different people have different needs and different preferences. Uh, and one thing that might be helpful for us is to get, um, is to, to work with an outside expert to get an audit of what we have and what we can improve on here uh, because you know, I, I, I read the law, and but I, I don't know a lot about providing accommodations. Um, and you know, Kevin and Mike have been doing uh, a huge amount of work on this, but we're all sort of learning on the fly. So bringing in uh, an expert to help us identify weak spots uh, and areas where we can improve, I think, would be particularly beneficial um, because from from my perspective, you know, it's the the next challenge is going to be the next uh, accommodation need that we haven't anticipated, um, and so it's it's just a question of that and having a fresh set of eyes that really understands um, the potential needs here and can make recommendations uh, would probably be a very beneficial and proactive step. Uh, to help improve access uh, to all people in the building. 
Thank you. Thank you. I see Amanda has your hand up. Amanda? Yes, hi, thank you so much, uh, Amanda Garces with the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And I am so happy that this conversation is happening. I do um, just want to add that some of the work that we've been trying to do and talk about around the language access for our incoming uh, refugee communities as well, um, it has to do with quality control also. Um, so about, you know, not having Google Translate or, so I think, those are further conversations that we need to look at because I think a lot of the agencies are saying, okay, well, we'll just put Google Translate and everybody can access it. And we know um, for a fact that that is not accurate in many of the languages. Maybe some of the Latin languages, Spanish might be really close enough. And the same as the captioning. So I know that when I speak because of my accent, the, cap the caption is often wrong. Um, it, not accurate. So having this, it, you know, live person that can do that is really great for the communities that do uh, read uh, the, the transcripts of the caption. So I just want to put a plug around quality control that not all the translators are the right translators for some of the things that we need. Um, and specifically when we are trying to pass legislation that has to do with BIPOC communities, that we really look into what is the type of translations that we need and uh, for to, to give accessibility to those who speak English as a second language or, or who don't, doesn't, don't speak English yet. So I just wanted to add that as something to think about. Thank you. And I want to say, Amanda, that it isn't, the translation that happens on the bottom that just happens by the computer, believe me, your accent might be misinterpreted sometimes, but so is everybody else. It's also misinterpreted. <laughs> it's on the, opportunity. Yes, yeah, they misinterpret almost everybody. So yeah. I see Dr. Crone had his hand up. Trudy, you're, you're muted. Yes, just a brief comment. I wanted to add um, to what you were saying. Danielle had suggested someone on the outside come in and do an audit. I think that's a fabulous idea. And my reason for that is moving here from Massachusetts five years ago now, you know, I did see a very big difference when it comes to access, you know, I mean, it was set up, you know, some was behind the times a little bit, but it was great to see the improvement. So I think if you were to have someone come in um, and include the stakeholders in the meeting, you know, so meet with the community to get a pulse of what it is their experience has been with the legislative process. So I think it would be very worthwhile to hear from the members directly from the communities that you're trying to accommodate. Thank you. That, yes, I believe that's true. So I want to ask um, Damien, you suggested that it would be good to have somebody from the outside. Is this a, a somebody who really understands interpreting and translations to come in and, and just do an audit of what we have and what we're doing well and what we could improve on and where we might be going next. Is that, are you talking about a position or are you talking about consulting with somebody or what? The, you the latter, consulting with someone from, uh, from outside. Uh -huh. um, so, it, and the, you know, I, I like to think of this as uh, sort of uh, proactive and preventative. So reaching out to someone from outside who has expertise to come in and review procedures and services that we have access to in the building and identify gaps, uh, uh, whether it's uh, language accessibility, but it could also be related to things like physical accessibility in the building, which um, has also been highlighted as a challenge in, uh, in other instances. So. But yeah, this, this is not specifically a position in the legislature. At some point in the future, um, you may want to consider a designated 
ADA position for the General Assembly, but that's a that's a very different conversation. I understand. So, well, I can tell you that for having been had to use a wheelchair for the last two weeks up here, um, this building is not particularly friendly to people in a wheelchair. There are some. And Brian Colomore can tell you because he was pushing me around and some places you had to take a real run at in order to get over the bumps and some places the doors are so um, so narrow that if you were doing your own wheelchair by the you know on the rails by the wheels you wouldn't have been able to get through the door so yeah it's it's not particularly usable yeah the the house discrimination prevention panel heard similar testimony from uh advocates with mobility disabilities and uh about a month ago yeah <laughs> so is this a um is this something we need to ask if it can be in the budget to have not a position but to to that you you can contract with somebody to um, come in and do that kind of an audit and maybe working along with Laura and Suzanne about how, who, who and where and how to get the person. I mean, I'm sure there are people out there who are really smart about this. It's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't think I would be the person to contract with them, but um, that it might go through the, for example, the sergeant at arms office because yeah. of the role in maintaining and managing the building. Um, but it, uh, some of the folks on the call here may have a better sense of what that looks like. Um, but it's if not, I'd be happy to look into it for the committee and get back to you. But it may be something that we need to set aside money in the legislative appropriation for. Right, that's what I was wondering. Susanna, do you have any idea what something like that would cost? Um, we are working to find out what it would cost. Our uh -huh. research and policy is, um, analyst is looking at that. What I was going to say is that um, there may be an opportunity to work with some federal partners on this. I know that um, OPWDD, ooh, is that? Is that federal or am I confusing that with a different state? Um, I will be looking into whether we can get an audit done um, using federal channels, if that's something that we would like to do. Another uh, option is we have some partners we have been um, getting to know, particularly from the National Conference of State Legislatures and from a couple of coalitions that this office is a member of that I think would be helpful here because they can bring a legislative lens from other jurisdictions. So I'd be happy to follow up with some more details um, about how they've accomplished that on their end. That would be great, thanks. Dr. Perron, I see you have your hand up. Yes, first of all, my apologies. I think I spelled your name wrong. I said Daniel and it's Damien, my apologies. <laughs> And then also, uh, I, I suggest you could um, contract with a pe person. Her name is Carol Richardson. That is an ADA coordinator in Massachusetts who's responsible for all of the legislative um, accessibilities issues, you know, and is deafblind themselves and coordinate um, ADA services for over 15 years, a phenomenal person who would be able to do that audit for you. So that's a contact person I would suggest. So I'm going to suggest that you send that um, contact information to, to Susanna and also to our committee and we'll um, make sure that, okay. Yeah, will do. Thanks. Does anybody else? Oh, sorry. Does anybody else have anything they want to um, 
weigh in on here? I, Linda, I see you're here. And you haven't said anything yet, but would you like, do you have anything to add? Would you like to? I am so late. I have no idea where you guys are, so I pass. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, anybody else have thoughts they'd like to? Yes, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering, I don't know whether it's a question for Kevin or Damien or Mike, but you, the funding that we've used so far in terms of setting something like this up today has to come out of the legislative budget. Do you get a signal or some sort of uh, information that says you're getting near, you know, a danger point in terms of spending too much money, or is it sort of open and very flexible? I don't know if I'm asking this the best way, but is someone eventually going to say, hey, wait a minute, you can't keep doing that because you're over budget? I guess that's what I'm asking. Uh, so, I'll, uh, Mike, I'll, I'll field this one to start. You can backfill if necessary. Um, so, Senator Collimore, uh, we don't have a direct appropriation within the legislature uh, that I'm aware of at this point for accessibility or um, uh, translation services. Uh, I believe we are taking it out of the legislature's overall appropriation uh, managed by the Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, we are very much intending and uh, will track all of the expenditures uh, for these services over the uh, the coming months and as they go forward that's part of uh, our rollout process for the uh, request forms okay thanks guys so actually it would be great if susanna if you are able to find any information if you have um if we need to try to put something in the budget um, uh, we we will be happy to do that, but if we can have some some idea of what we might need to put in there to continue this process and maybe go farther, whatever whatever it is, um, if you can, you know, you find out that NCSL and the federal government can help us with this much, but we're going to need to have some matching money or whatever that would be great if you could do that yes i would be happy to do that but i do just want to stress that it is our goal that this be genuinely statewide so the money uh -huh. the money package that we're going to submit to you is going to cover all three branches of state government so okay. uh, i want you all to be prepared for that okay yeah okay got it thank you dr Perron. Oh, my apologies. I forgot to take my hand down. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, we no, I had nothing you. more to add. Thank you. We usually ask if that's an old hand or a new hand, but. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add here? Any more questions from the committee? I. <laughs> So I'm I'm going to say to Damien and Mike and um, Kevin that you've been very helpful and and um, helping us understand what you're doing and where you're going yeah. with this and and the concern that you're showing around this and working with Dale and other people like Laura and other other people and um, I want to thank everybody that came and. Um, maybe what we'll do is right at the end, toward the end of the session, we'll just have a check-in and see where we are. I think that sounds great. One thing I'd yes. like to know. So I, uh, I assume in addition to Massachusetts, there are other states that have addressed this issue and have, have come up with some solutions. I'd just be curious to see, I mean, we're a much smaller state than Massachusetts, but it would be interesting to see what their budget is for this uh -huh. and how it's, you know, what they've spent in the last since it's been uh, uh, provided in the Massachusetts legislature, how much it's been used and what they're spending on it. And I do see Susanna's hand up. 
Thank you. I did just want to add one more piece, which is that as we think about how we provide language access in the legislative process, we also have to remember language access in the outgrowths of the legislative process. And specifically, I'm thinking about one in particular, the BIPOC biz convenings sessions. We had heard from the vendor early on concerns that there wasn't enough money built in for translations. And because of the runway and timing and budget process, we ended up not augmenting that figure. But as we consider legislation that requires any kind of public engagement component, it's really important that we build in sufficient dollars to make the same level of accommodations that we're talking about here in any of the public processes that we're prescribing as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, so we'll try to schedule um, just a check-in um, later on in the session just to see where we are and, and um, see if we need to put anything in the budget and um, Yes, and Alice. Yeah, so, and Laura, would you be kind enough to send us what the statistics are? Because I, because this, I, 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 I'm not sure where my notes are for it, but I think it would be great if we started to add, put in our files the statistics about the deaf and hard of hearing in the in Vermont and stuff. Any any statistics you have on this community would be great. Particularly as it's changed, sadly, so much. Yeah, lost teams yeah, I'll be. Great. Sure, I'll be able to send that. Um, that would be great. Because yeah. sadly, those numbers sure. have changed. Sadly, with the with the demise of the Austin School. Yeah. And and how I mean, yeah. I mean, how many are, are mainstreamed in our schools? How many are getting? Are, you know, are are working? Right. I don't know. The whole the whole statistics on on the deaf and hard of hearing in the in Vermont, if you have it. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say I have everything um, that you're asking for, but I'll be, I'll go ahead and gather what I have and, and okay. hand that over to okay. you. Perfect. Thanks. Oh, I like that. That's thank perfect. you. And thank okay. you. For